pushing it to do all of the gas laws we are going to meet in person that way I can see your faces I need to know what you're not getting so we are going to meet in person on Thursday because it was pretty close to 50 50 and I think I added one somewhere so on the first vote so we're going to meet in person it's pretty close to 50 50 this way we can get it and go over it but I will find a classroom and I'll post that information on Thursday I'll tell you which sponsor because I really do want to see your faces. Okay. Um, Monday, you have some things to do. You have homework 23. You're going to have math and med puzzles that are over the topics we're covering today. So you will be able to complete these after today if you want to get a jump start. Tuesday is our next exam. It will include the information I discussed Thursday morning, but it will not include the gas law task. Will include Thursday morning. I normally don't do that. I normally give you a week out, but we are at the end of the semester. So this test, it will include the information I go over Thursday morning, but I won't put the gas law chapter on it. I'll wait and put that strictly on the final exam. Um, on Wednesday of next week, you do have two other puzzles that are due, uh, Boyle's Charles combined and the ideal gas law. Now, I will admit Tuesday night and Wednesday night, I am in a crazy grading because I'm going to try to have your grades to you by Thursday. And then Thursday, my goal is to finish energy and discuss how to study for my final exam. And to some extent, what stuff. Um, Thursday of next, uh, Thursday, December 15th is your final from 8 to 10 a.m. Now, there is a bonus opportunity. 
one last one that is tomorrow night at 6 p.m. in Lewis Science Center 102. It's the Science Wednesday. It's the Science of Ceramics. Uh, Dr. Ashley Hicks will be there taking uh, role of everybody that attends, and I will get that information. And it is worth up to five points for you to be there, for you to pay attention. Um, the last thing is the grade book columns in the final. Again, we are nearing the end. We have very few grades left. I will be inserting columns associated with those grades um, today or tomorrow. And there is another column that's going to pop up. And so as of right now, you see a total column. That total column includes all the grades that I'm dropping, already taken out of the equation. So in other words, that total column that you see is after the drop of an exam, after the drop of some homework, after the drop of uh, the math and med puzzles, after the drop of the quizzes that I was going to drop, after the drop of one of the last grades. There is a second column that's about to pop up. I wanted to explain this column before it pops up. I am going to uh, open up a column today. That column is your grade with all four exams. I still drop your lowest lab. I still drop your lowest homeworks. I still drop your lowest quiz, stuff like that but it includes all four exams. Now, after I get Tuesday's exam grade, if you are happy with your grade with all four exams, you don't have to come to my class. If you are unhappy with all four exam grades, then you can come to the final and I'll drop the notice the same grade. Now, if you decide once I post the exam grades for Thursday, I mean for Tuesday of next week, if you decide once I post those exam grades for Tuesday of next week, you will have one week to tell me you're not coming to the final because I don't want to waste paper. I don't want to kill any more trees than I have to for any exams. So, any questions over those announcements? You come to the final. I haven't actually thought of that one yet. I think you're going to answer it on Thursday because I want to think about how I want to answer that question. So, by not going to the final, that's like a drop and only have a fourth now. In a sense, yes. Okay, now, one last announcement I wanna make. If anybody is thinking about changing their major, because I don't think I had any chemistry majors in here, but if anybody is planning to be a chemistry major starting in the spring, I have a scholarship opportunity available. If you're gonna be a chemistry or biochemistry major starting in the spring semester of 2023, there's a scholarship available. Uh, it is $5,000 per semester, so $2,000 per year. Um, you have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. You have to be Pell Grant eligible. Again, you've got to be a chemistry or biochemistry major starting in the spring of 2023. And you have to have an overall cumulative GPA of 2.75 or higher at the end of the, this fall semester, and you can apply for this scholarship. So if you want more information, it's up here, you can pick it up at the end of class. But again, you got to be a chem major for it. Any questions? Okay, I'm about to get into the lecture material. Now, I will warn you, I am going to move through the first portions of this rather rapidly. Because in part, we've already discussed the laboratory. 
and in part because the lecture videos are out there and it's mostly that it's lecture and I want to get to some problems. So keep that in mind as we go. So when we discuss a chemical reaction, I've mentioned to you that the fact, the fact that the elemental symbols are our alphabet in history. We start to combine up uh, our, the alphabet, our elemental symbols, in, to make compounds, and the compounds are our words. When you combine words, you make sentences. Well, when we combine compounds, we start to have reactions happen. Now, to describe a reaction, you really need to have multiple pieces of information available. Because unlike English, in the case of chemistry, as one sentence, one reaction tells a huge part, uh, tells the story. So we only need one sentence to describe a story for us. Now, one of the things that we you have to have is your reactants, you have to have your products. I mean, that should be obvious. You need to include the state of matter of your reactants and the state of matter of your products. We've discussed that and we've discussed how to determine those states of matter. The other thing that should be involved in all the reactions is some form of energy. Every single reaction involves energy. And if you'll recall from the laboratory, uh, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So I drew a picture on the uh, chalkboard in the lab. And basically, we discussed the system and the surroundings. The system is anything associated with the reactant, reaction. In other words, it's your reactants and it is your products. That is the system. Everything else is surrounding. So the water that the reactants or the water that the products are dissolved in is surroundings. The container holding that is surroundings. The air above the reaction is surroundings. The only thing that is the system is the reactants and the products. Now we talked about the fact that if we follow the law of third, the first law of thermodynamics, since energy cannot be created nor destroyed, any energy moving into the system had to come from the surroundings and any energy that moves out of the system has to go into the surroundings because it has to, it can't be created nor destroyed. Now, what sign did we give the energy going into the system? Hmm? We gave it a positive value. We said it's positive because if you put energy into the system, what happens to the system's energy? it increases. So that, that's why it's positive. Now, we gave the energy leaving the system a negative value because we're describing what's happening to the system. The system's energy is becoming negative. I mean, excuse me, no, let me rephrase that. The system's energy is going down. That's what I meant to say. So positive means that the system's energy increased. Where negative means that the system's energy decreased. And I indicated in the lab that positive and negative when we're talking about energy is not the same as what you would think about in a math course. A negative energy does not mean we go into the into a less than zero balance. Let's think about that. Let's think about what that really means. 
A negative energy does not mean we go into a zero, it goes below a zero balance. Think about it to yourself. You either have energy or you don't have energy. Can you have a negative energy? No. Zero energy means that all motion stops. So when it hits zero, nothing happens, but you cannot go negative. You cannot have an energy that is negative. Our signs of positive and negative just describe whether the energy goes into the system or whether it goes out of the system. It is not meant to be the same thing as what you think about when you think about the mathematical expression of a positive and negative. Now, another thing I mentioned in the laboratory is energy is a state function. Basically, what a state function is, is it is a function where the values are determined solely on what you started with and what you ended with. It doesn't matter the path that you take to get there. Just an example, let's say I started in New York and want to go to Seattle. I could try to find the straightest path across the United States from New York to Seattle. Or I could go from New York down to Texas to Seattle. What a state function means is that it doesn't matter whether I go in a straight path or if I go from wherever, uh, from New York through Alabama, through Texas, up to uh, Missouri, over to Arizona. It doesn't matter what path I take. All that matters is I started in New York and I finished in Seattle. That's what a state function means. Now, when we talk about a change in energy, folks, delta always means change. Delta always means final minus initial. So if we're talking about our energy, we're talking about the energy of the, fi the final energy of the system minus the initial energy of the system. Delta means change, final minus initial. And we will use that symbology or symbolism from here until, uh, well, they're all chemistry courses. Delta means change. Means final minus initial. So if you're talking about the system, delta E of the system would be the final energy of the system minus the initial energy of the system. But you could talk about the surroundings because we talked about the fact that uh, according to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created nor can it be destroyed. So if you're talking about the surroundings, then the delta E of the surroundings would be equal to the energy, the final energy of the surroundings minus the initial energy of the surroundings. questions to this point. This is just driving home this concept of the first law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. Energy is a state function. It de depends solely on what you, where you start and where you end. A change in energy would be the final minus the initial for whatever you're talking about. Now, energy can be in the form of potential energy or it can be in the form of kinetic energy. Potential energy is the energy of location or in other words, it's the energy that something will potentially occur. And then kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So, I 
have a book. This book currently has potential energy. Now, as of right now, the surroundings, which is me, is supplying this book with energy. But this book has potential energy because it is going to fall. And when it falls, it's going to transfer to kinetic energy. And then when it hits the ground, wake up, it's going to go back to potential energy. Potential energy is the energy of location. It's the potential energy it can do something. Kinetic energy is the actual energy of motion. So let's go to my core drawing up here. This is me holding the book. Okay. So the surroundings, which is my arm, is supplying energy. To the system, which is the book. So there's energy going into the system. So at that pause point, it would be a positive energy because I'm adding energy to the system. Now, as I release the book, the book fell and that would be transferred into kinetic energy. Because now the energy is in motion. When the book hit the ground, it now has, again, a potential energy. Now let's talk about this overall energy. When the book was hanging in the air, there was a high potential that something would occur. There was no way I could hold that book up forever. There was a high potential it was gonna, something was gonna occur. When the book hit the ground, the likelihood of the book flipping over on its own or falling someplace else is not very realistic. So when the book hit the ground, it now has a low potential energy. But according to the first law of thermodynamics, energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. So how could we go from high to low? Well, the answer is as the system fell through, or as our book fell through the air, it scattered air particles. Because no two things can occupy the same space. So in other words, it transferred some of its energy as it scattered those air particles. When the book hit the ground, you heard sound. That is also a form of energy. So in other words, there was a transfer of energy in the form of sound. And although I hate to admit it, I'm sure there was dust on the floor. And so it probably transferred some of that dust all up in the, into the air. So it transferred it to, again, the dust. So it didn't, so in other words, folks, we're following the first law of thermodynamics. We just transferred some of that potential energy, that high potential energy as it fell, we were transferring some of that energy to other things. So that when it hit the ground, it had a low potential energy. 
Now, it's pretty easy, in my opinion, to kind of understand potential energy and kinetic energy and the first law of thermodynamics when you're talking about a book and it falling through the air. But it's a lot more difficult when you have to think about something you cannot physically touch, which are chemical compounds. So where is this energy? Where is this potential energy in all in a chemical compound? Well, that energy is found within the bonds of the chemical compound. So if you'll recall, we would have, in the case of this reaction of H2 plus O2 going to form water, we have two hydrogens, which were single bond hydrogens. We had an oxygen, which had a double bond. And then we formed two water molecules which ultimately led to four OOH bonds, two in each one. It is these bonds it is the bonds that house the energy. So let me pull up a picture of this reaction. That one. Okay, so. This is a diagram, it's hard. I'm sorry that my, the top piece is not allow me to see it, but it's 2H2 molecules plus O2 goes to form two water. You have your hydrogen bonds, you have your oxygen double bond oxygen. Now, there is potential energy found within those bonds. Now, something would come in and it would cause these bonds to break. Maybe it's an ignition source, which is most likely the case causing the bonds to break. When the bonds break, it goes from being potential energy found within the bonds to kinetic energy as those individual atoms are now free to move around. Then those individual atoms go to form the water molecules. And now we go back to potential energy because again, the potential energy is found within the bonds. Now, depending upon our starting energy and the ending energy, will determine whether this process is a favorable process or not. In the case of this reaction occurring, it's a very favorable process. Once you hit it with a, uh, once you hit this reaction with a ignition source, you get a pretty loud boom. In fact, I've got no loud enough boom as oxygen reacted with the hydrogen once I made that ignition source that I'm not um, clocks off of walls because it caused such reverberation in the classroom. Now let's think about what I just said because that's going to help us understand how well, why we see this curve that we see. Yes, I ignited it. I took in these bonds that had a potential energy. I ignited it and caused the bonds to break. As they came back together, energy was given off. That energy was in the form of reverberations along the walls, a sound that I always do what's called elephant ears, where I put up my hands in front to block the sound. It actually helps with the sound. It is so loud. But then the uh, water molecules, as those water molecules formed in other words, it gave off energy to the surroundings. 
It only took a little spark to get it going, but once it went, it went. Bang. So you still have that same high potential energy. That became kinetic energy. That became potential energy. That was lower in potential energy. And because the um, as the water molecules were formed, sound was created. We followed the first law of thermodynamics because that energy was not lost. It was just transferred to the surroundings. So again, delta is final minus initial. Now in a reaction, Final is your products. I mean, that's what you end with. Initial is your reactants. That's what you start with. So we're still following that fact that delta is final minus initial. It's just now we're labeling it with reactants and products. Questions about this? So now we've talked about potential energy and kinetic energy and where they're found within the chemicals. We've talked about energy as a whole, system and surroundings. We've talked about potential energy and kinetic energy and where they're found. Any questions to this point? Okay, then we're gonna move on to the next piece. So, we know where the energy is found in a chemical, it's in the box. But how do we calculate the energy? Well, the energy, is equal to Q plus W. Q is heat and W is work. So the energy is going to be related to the heat that is generated or absorbed by our reaction. And the work is going to be associated with the work that the reaction does on its surroundings. Because keep in mind, we're focused on the reaction. That's all we care about is what's going on with our system. Yes, we follow the law, first law of thermodynamics, but all we're focused really on is what's happening to our system, which is the reactants and the products. So Q is the heat associated with the reactants and products. W is the work done by the system on the surroundings. Now work is pressure volume work. So let me go back to my images. In this diagram, what you have is you have a container. We have our substances reactants and products, we have our system. And in this container, what we have is a movable piston. Now, our reaction occurs and the resultant material pushes against the piston. So it's doing work on the piston because it's pushing the piston up. It's doing work on the piston. Now, this change in volume from the initial to the final, that's our change in volume. And then we have to focus on the pressure here. 
So that's why it's called pressure volume work because it's the pressure of the molecules pushing on the system to change the volume. So we can say that work is equal to P delta V. Now, that P, what sign would it have? Is it positive, which means the surroundings are doing something? Or is it negative because it means the system is doing something? It would be negative because the system is applying pressure that causes that change of volume. So our E here is really equal to Q, which is the heat minus P delta V. In other words, I replace the work with the pressure volume. Now, there was a reason that in that particular image, everything was in gas form. And that is because only if, it, only if you're dealing with gases is that pressure volume going to be dramatic. Think about that. Let's think about that from an actual example. I'm going to have a water balloon and I'm going to have a balloon with gas, helium. <laughs> the water does some work on the surroundings. I mean, mainly because it's sloshing around. But it's not going to, other than increasing the amount of water, it's not changing the volume. In other words, the water itself doesn't really do much. It doesn't apply that much pressure. The pressure it is applying is the volume of the water we add, not the actual water molecules themselves in the liquid form. But now if you take that and go to a helium and a gas, those gas molecules are moving around at all sorts of paces of every direction and they're punching against the walls of the balloon. They're applying pressure to the balloon. So gases do apply much more pressure. And so really that work piece becomes important when we're dealing with gases. But otherwise, the dominant factor is the heat, the transfer of heat. Which we talked about in lab. So we said Heat is equal to M cat, where M was the mass, C was the specific heat, and W T was the final minus the initial. We use this formula in the lab when we did the thermodynamics lab. Now, we said we have to follow the first law of thermodynamics. So in other words, whatever the Q of the system is, the heat of the system has to be equal to the heat of the surroundings. Now these two, the difference in them is that one has to be negative because if the system absorbed the heat, then the surroundings had to give off the heat. So they're the exact same value, just opposite in sign. So let's get to some out. Find the amount of heat needed to raise, oh my, 5.00 grams of a substance from 20.0 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius if the specific heat of the substance is 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. Okay, folks, let's break this thing down. The first thing I notice is I want I want heat.
and heat is equal to Q. So I will be looking for Q. Since I'm looking for Q, that means the equation I'm gonna need is Q is equal to impact. So I need to know the mass, I need to know the specific heat, and I need to know delta T, delta T being T final minus and T initial because delta T, delta is always final minus initial. So the mass is 5.00 grams. The specific heat we were told was 2.01 joules per gram degree Celsius. And yes, you will be given the specific heat for everything because of this constants and you got to look up constants. T final was our 30.0 degrees Celsius and our T initial was 20.0 degrees Celsius. Using our equation and filling in the pieces of information, we have 5.00 grams times the specific heat of 2.01 joules per gram degrees Celsius times our T final, which was uh, 30 degrees Celsius minus our initial, which was 20 degrees Celsius. And keying that into the calculator. You get a Q equal to 100.5 joules, which if we are looking at significant digits, we would round to 101 joules. And the reason it is joules is because the grams cancel and the degrees Celsius cancel. So it's just joules. Anytime you're talking about energy unit, joules is one of our common energy units. There are multiple other energy units, just joules is one of the favorites. Questions? So what does it mean? What did it mean, what we just said? It meant you had your substance. That was your initial substance. In the end, you have the substance, but looking at this sign, which is positive, it means that we added to that substance 101 joules. In other words, the difference between these two folks is 101 joules that was added. To cause something to occur. Questions? And if we're being technical, that 101 joules that was added had to come from the surroundings. If we want, so that we can follow the law, the first law of thermodynamics. Since energy cannot be created, nor can it be destroyed. Okay, so let's look at another example. An alloy of unknown composition is heated to 137 degrees and is placed in 100 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. If the final temperature of the water is 
4 degrees Celsius and the alloyed weighed 2.71 grams, what is the specific heat capacity of the alloy given that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius? Okay, let's talk about something I noted. I note, noted that what we had is we had an alloy and we had water. So in other words, I had two substances. That were in contact with each other. So that means heat is going to be transferred. And heat is always transferred from the hotter object to the colder object until the two objects reach equilibrium. Folks, what this means is that the is that T final is the same for both objects. Knowing that concept is important when we start to break this thing down. So again, one of the things that I note is I am dealing with uh, the concept of heat. I got specific heat capacity. I've got heated. Um, I'm dealing with heat. Heat is equal to Q. But I'm dealing with two things. So I'm going to use the equations Q of the system is equal to negative Q of the surroundings. But I'm going to replace the Q with my MCAT. So MCAT for my system would equal negative MCAT for the surroundings. So we have two substances. We have an alloy and we have a wall and we have water. We were told in this question that the alloy weighed 2.71 grams. We were told in this question, the alloy started at 137 degrees Celsius. We were told that it was added to a mass of 100 grams of water at a initial temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. We were told that the final temperature of the water was 36.4 degrees Celsius. And because heat is transferred until the two objects reach equilibrium, that means that the final temperature of our alloy was also 36.4 degrees Celsius. 
In the question, we were asked to determine the specific heat of the alloy, and we were told that the specific heat of water was 4.184 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So using our equation that we came up with before, it was the mass of the system. So 2.71 grams times the specific heat of the system times T final minus T initial. So it's 36.4 degrees Celsius minus 137 degrees Celsius. That is equal to a negative Q of the surroundings. So that would be 100 grams of water times 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times T final of 36.4 degrees Celsius minus T initial of 25 degrees Celsius. And now we do the math. This left-hand side becomes negative 272.626. And that would be in grams degrees Celsius times the specific heat. The right-hand side becomes a negative 4,769.76 joules. Dividing both sides through by the negative 272.626, you get a specific heat capacity of 17 point, let's see. Five joules per gram degrees Celsius for this alloy. Common mistakes. The most common mistake is students forget the negative. Q of the system is equal to negative Q of the surroundings. Don't forget the negative. The other common mistake is remembering what delta stands for. It's final minus initial. Questions about that problem? Let's look at another example that's probably the toughest type of example you'll encounter with this stuff. Given the specific heat of gold is 0 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius, calculate the final temperature. If 200 grams of, or 200 gram, if a 200 gram block of gold at 100 degrees Celsius is placed in 50 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so again, I notice I have two things. I have gold and I got water. I'm told the specific heat of gold is 0 0.129 joules per gram degrees Celsius. 
I've been asked to calculate the final temperature of the gold. Given the mass of gold as 200.0 grams and the temperature, the initial temperature of the gold is 100 degrees Celsius. I am told that it was placed in 50 grams of water, which is 50.0 grams for the mass, initially at 25 degrees Celsius, and the specific heat capacity, which you will be given on an exam, but it was in the previous problem, is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. Now, if I'm thinking about my equation where I'm dealing with Q of the uh, system is equal to a negative Q of the surroundings, since we have two things in contact. So MCAT for the system is equal to negative MCAT for the surroundings. Then in order to be able to complete this, I also need the T final for my surroundings, which is water. But here's where you have to remember, heat's gonna be transferred from the hotter object to the colder object until the two objects reach equilibrium, meaning that the final temperatures are the same. Okay, plugging all of this in. So my system, I have a mass of 200 grams times the specific heat of 0 0.129 joules per gram degree Celsius times delta T, so that's T final, which I don't know, minus T initial, which is um, 100 degrees Celsius, is equal to a negative mass or of the water, which was 50.0 gra uh, grams times the specific heat of water, which is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius times the delta T, which is T final minus T initial, which is 25 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I'm gonna do this out in steps because I know that this algebra gets crazy at times. First thing I'm doing is multiplying the mass times the specific heat. So that's going to be 25.8 joules per degree Celsius on the left-hand side times our T final minus our T initial. That's going to be equal to 209.2 joules per degree Celsius times T final minus 25 degrees Celsius. Now you have to use the distributive property. 25.8 joules per degree Celsius times T final. Minus 2580 joules is equal to a negative 209.2 joules per degree Celsius times T final plus 5,230 joules. Again, the most common mistake here is not, is remembering to use that negative two, for instance, with this negative here, it's 
remembering to use the negative with the first piece of information, but forgetting to use that negative with the second piece of information in the parentheses. So you've got to remember that negative both times. Now what I do is I rearrange this, adding like things to the same sign. So basically it's gonna be the 25.8 joules per degree Celsius times T final plus 209.2 joules degree Celsius times T final is equal to the um, 5230 joules plus 2580 joules. So this is 235 joules per degree Celsius times T final, because now I can combine these two pieces is equal to 700 or 7,810 joules. Then dividing through by the 235, you get your final temperature, which comes out to be 30, point nine degrees Celsius. Questions. So basically what this means, folks, is that the gold, which was at a higher temperature, transferred heat to the surroundings, which was the water. Until the gold and the water both reach 30.9 degrees Celsius. That's what this map tells us, that the gold transferred heat, since it was a hotter object, to the water until the gold and the water both reach 30.9 degrees Celsius. Yes. Uh, so when I combine 25.8 and 209.2, that should be 235. Okay. You can combine them because now they are like items. They're both multiplied by T final. So you can combine these two items. I see what happened. Okay, so did you add? Yes, that's what you did. Okay. So yes, when I, when I rearranged put like items on the same side, that negative becomes a positive. And that negative becomes a positive. Questions? The math chemistry had puzzles. The first one deals with problems similar to the very first problem I gave you today. The second one deals with the problem similar to the last two I gave you today. So you have all the information if you want to complete those. They're not due until next Monday, but you now have all the information you can complete them. Yes. Where is the uh, 2,580 joules and 2,500 So if you multiply 25.8 times 100, you get 2,580. So, or I should say 25.8 times a negative 100, you get a negative 2580. And negative 209.2 times a negative 25 is a positive 5230. Other questions? Folks, this is algebra. 
that you're performing. It's just you're performing the distributive property within the mathematics. Then you're, if you're thinking about it from an algebra standpoint, the question that I was asked by this one, you've got, when I took and moved this negative, I technically was adding to a 9.2 both sides. If you add 209.2 to the right side, it would cancel out the negative 209.2, and then you added the 209.2 to the left side. But these are some of the algebraic skills that are commonly used in this uh, example. Any questions? Okay, then we're going to at least get into the introduction to the enthalpy. I will actually get into a great, uh, a lot more detail on Thursday with respect to enthalpy. Okay. So we said that energy or I should say the mathematical calculation associated with energy is that energy is equal to Q plus W. And we said that work is a ne negative pressure volume work. So that this equation becomes energy is equal to Q minus P delta V. Or in other words, if we want to spell it out, that would be E is equal to Q minus P times volume final minus volume initial. because that's what Delta means. Now, at constant volume, which occurs in a bomb calorimeter, if you have constant volume, then the Delta V lines up equal to zero because the final volume is equal to the initial volume. So it comes out as zero. And zero multiplied by anything is zero. So this equation becomes E is equal to Q minus zero. Or in other words, E is simply equal to Q. So for a, with a bomb calorimeter, we can determine the heat directly. With the bomb calorimeter, we can determine the heat directly. Now, in the lab though, we used a constant pressure calorimeter when we used our coffee cup system. And if you have a constant pressure, that means that you cannot get rid of the work component. At constant P, you cannot get rid of your work component. because the volume can still change. But if we rearrange this to solve for Q, then you get Q is equal to the energy plus P delta V. And this folks is equal to the enthalpy. which is frequently known as the heat of reaction. Yes, sorry, thank you.
Now, the amount of heat generated is equivalent to the amount of substance. Let's take it. Let's, let's take something such as water on the stove. If you have a tiny, tiny amount of water, it doesn't take much heat before it's in a boil. But if you have a huge vat of water, it's going to take a long time before that thing boils. Because there's a direct correlation between the amount of heat and the amount of substance. So that is why in lab, we had to use this equation to calculate our enthalpy. It was the enthalpy of this. Uh, the entropy of our reaction was equal to the Q for the system, our reaction, divided by the amount of substance in moles. Now, a reaction can be described using enthalpy as being either endothermic or exothermic. If it is endothermic, then you will have a positive delta H value when you list the delta H by itself. Now, if you go back to my little ball, positive means that you had to add energy to the system. What is added to a reaction? The reactants are a product. The reactants. So heat is a reactant. <laughs> when it is an endothermic process. And what that positive means is again, we have to add energy. It means that the reaction will not occur unless constant energy is added. So endothermic reactions tend to be unfavorable with respect to enthalpy. Exothermic reactions have a negative delta H when listing by itself. And if you'll think about that diagram, it meant that energy was given off. Well, what's given off in a reaction? The reactants are the products, the products. So it means heat is a product. The overall change in heat is a product of the reaction. Now, the nice thing is with, with respect to enthalpy, what this means is once you get that reaction going, it's gonna go all by itself. It's not gonna need constant monitoring. So this is a favorable process with respect to enthalpy. What we're going to do on 
Thursday is we're going to look at these enthalpies. We're going to look at a react. We're going to look at a reaction, the enthalpy of the reaction, and what happens when we change the reaction. When we flip them or when we multiply them by something, what happens? And then we get into Hessen's and then the piece of formation. And with that, I will see you Thursday. <laughs>